before we get started talking, uh, why don't we listen to this thing a little bit, okay? All right. The Wall of Doom thanks you. All right, so I want to tell you a little bit about uh, what this instrument is. Um, it is uh, a modular Moog synthesizer, from uh, the core of which is from April of 1967. Uh, I was born in July of 1967, so um, look at me. I mean, I think it looks better, you know. Uh, in any case, I, I purchased uh, the core instrument um, in 1995, and it was in pretty bad shape. Uh, and it went through um, a fairly extensive restoration, and I just kind of looked all over the country, all over the world, really, to find additional modules to, to turn it into the instrument uh, that it is today. Um, it first um, made actual music in 1999, four years later, and then uh, 2001, as Michelle mentioned, uh, it went on tour uh, in Europe. And in case you're wondering, um, it, the cartage bill to send uh, this instrument to Europe and back was about $10,000. So um, obviously that's not something we do all the time. But um, uh, thanks to Michelle and, and thanks to August and Amos, we were able to repackage it into these six cases uh, for the Mogus Operandi event we had over at the Orange Peel. Uh, in May, and that's going to allow us uh, to take the instrument out quite a bit more. Uh, so it's a, uh, yeah, it's a 22 oscillator, um, how many, what, six filter um, analog synthesizer uh, using all uh, discrete modules. Um, and it's got a few custom bits that I'll talk about uh, in just a second. So uh, before I talk about uh, some details of the synth, I just want to do a real quick uh, primer on analog synthesis, on subtractive synthesis, and what's that, what that's all about. A lot of you people are going yeah, to go, yeah, I know how it works. But OK, maybe some people don't. So we'll, we'll run through this fast. OK, so let's go to our first slide. 
Uh, we start with an oscillator, and what the heck is an oscillator? An oscillator is uh, an electronic device that oscillates back and forth. And if you turn it down really slow, it just sounds like you'll just hear clicking. In fact, take my mic. So here's an oscillator set to a very, very low frequency. And then as we speed it up, it turns into a tone. Okay, so that's our oscillator. Um, that's, that's fun and all that, but uh, it's, it's kind of a, I don't know, kind of a plain sound. What sounds really nice is when we add multiple oscillators together, and then those oscillators uh, phase against each other, they chorus a little bit, and it gives you just a much, much richer tone. Uh, those three oscillators have to be mixed together, so we take those three oscillators into a mixer, like we see here, and that gives us just a, a monophonic output. I'm sorry, a monaural output. I've got to watch my terms here. Uh, and then we go into a filter. Uh, the filter is perhaps the thing that, not perhaps, the filter is the thing that Bob Moog is definitely most known for. And the filter is what gives the sound its color. Uh, you go from, from bright to dark, and you can have resonant peaks, and, and of course the filter gets animated, and that's really you know, the tonality uh, of the instrument. Uh, from the filter, leave it up. Oh, you blew it. All right. <laughs> from, from the filter, uh, we go to a VCA, uh, which, which is a, a voltage-controlled amplifier. Nice, August. A voltage-controlled amplifier. Um, I always thought that was kind of a weird term. I thought voltage-controlled attenuator was more like it because it really just kind of makes the sound softer. Um, so that's our, our control of volume. So the filter is our, our control of tone, and then the VCA is our control of volume. And then from the VCA, we go to the outside world uh, in this image we have here. Okay, so that's our basic um, subtractive synthesis signal flow. This is what you see on, on a, a Mini Moog, on a Model D, on a Voyager. Um, this is the basic flow. Now, uh, some of these elements have to be controlled. So let's go to the next one. What we do is uh, we have a keyboard that generates pitch. Pitch goes to the oscillators. So whatever note you play on the keyboard, that tells the oscillators what frequency or what pitch to play at. OK, then, of course, we want our filter and our VCA, our tone and our volume, to be animated. And so we don't want those to just be static. We want those to move. So we have an envelope um, that can uh, basically, over time, controls the tonality and the volume of the sound. So you see there that the envelope is modulating or changing both the filter and the VCA. Uh, and then, of course, we have to trigger that uh, envelope in some way. It just doesn't work on its own. So um, we have what's called a gate signal. And a, a traditional gate signal is when you press down a key. You can, of course, generate gate signals in lots of different ways, but that's the simplistic view of it. OK, so this is our basic. Uh, traditional subtractive synthesis, analog synth synthesis signal flow. I'm not going to say that well after a few beers, but. Um, so now I want to talk about um, the wall of doom and some of the interesting things we're doing and how we're going beyond just a traditional signal flow. And the beauty and the power of modular synthesis is that it allows you to create any signal flow you like. Well, uh, the first thing that, that I uh, love is the sound of lots and lots of oscillators, as you just heard. Um, and it's like having 22 oscillators is not enough. What I'd really like is to have an octave down of those oscillators as well. So uh, there's a very simple um, electronic method for deriving an octave down from a single oscillator and to create what's called a sub-oscillator. So what you do is you take your favorite waveform. In this case, the, uh, the falling sawtooth wave is, is my personal favorite waveform. I have all the you know, collectors, figures, and all that for it. Uh, to create the sub-oscillator or the octave down, what you do is you hard clip that sawtooth wave, which means you just, you just keep turning up the gain against the ceiling, and it gets squared off. Okay, it's the same concept of, of putting an electric guitar through a, a guitar amplifier and distorting. So you, you square off the wave, uh, and now you have a, you've generated a, you've derived, rather, a square wave from your sawtooth wave. And now once you've done that, in order to make it 
an octave lower, you just double the period of the wave. So the square wave now gets twice as big, therefore an octave lower. And that's our very, very simple, non-engineer, like myself, way of, of describing uh, the sub-oscillator. So what I've done on my system is for every oscillator I have, they go into a mixer, which are these three boxes on the bottom of the, the racks with the blue and green LEDs. Um, the top row are just the, the basic inputs for each oscillator. Um, the middle row with the green, those are additional inputs in case one day I decide that 22 oscillators is not enough and I need more. Um, but then the bottom row, these are sub-oscillators. And it's that circuit right there that takes uh, the, the, the input of the mixer, uh, branches it off into its own channel, squares it off, doubles the period, uh, and then we have our octave below. And so I have switches and pots so I can turn the sub-oscillators on and off, turn them up and down, and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and what's, again, really uh, amazing about modular synthesis is typically, if you were going to do a sub-oscillator, you'd think, well, that would be in the oscillator, right? Not, not in some external weird thing. But... Um, you know, the, the original Moog oscillators, the 901Bs and then later the 921Bs, I'm not going to go into these, you know, at this point, really precious, um, rare pieces of history and, and start drilling into them and changing the circuitry and all that. So to do it externally in these custom mixers that I've built is really the perfect way to do it. And that allows modules from... Uh, April 20th, 1967, to integrate with uh, a mixer that was built, you know, some, gosh, 35 years later. So that's, that's uh, a pretty amazing thing. Let's go to the next slide. Um, you saw the basic signal flow. Here is uh, a signal flow that's my, my favorite um, signal flow to do on this instrument. And uh, several of the racks actually have been configured in order to support this particular configuration. So what I'm doing is I have a, a, uh, a, a got to get this right, a monophonic voice, meaning one, I can play one note at a time, but it's a stereo signal path. So that means several oscillators on the left, several oscillators on the right, each oscillator, I'm, I'm sorry, each, each group of oscillators goes through its own filter, goes through its own VCA. So you have this, these two separate uh, audio signal paths. So it is a monophonic stereo voice. It sounds like an oxymoron, but it's not. Um, and then the amazing thing about this with the modular system is I can control um, those two separate audio paths with one pitch and one gate signal. So that means when I add vibrato, when I trigger an envelope, uh, it's triggering both audio paths, and, they're, and they're, they respond uh, exactly the same. So it's, it's different than if I were to, say, MIDI two Voyagers together with the same patch, because they, they wouldn't be getting exactly the same control voltage. Maybe the phase of the LFO wouldn't be in exactly the same place. But with a modular system like that, uh, it's really an amazing sound. And the, the sample and hold pattern that you heard, the bass that you heard, even the lead was going through this monophonic uh, stereo configuration. So that's just one example of, of the power of modular synthesis and what makes this instrument uh, just so darn cool. That and, the, uh, and all the lights, of course, too. So um, I know we're a little bit limit on time, limited on time. I want to introduce now uh, my friend August Worley. And Aug August is going to talk to you about uh, some more esoteric um, things that you can do uh, with the modular synth, and as well as uh, give us some pretty cool war stories about being out on the road with, uh, with the modular. So let's hear it for August. Thank you. Thanks a lot. There you go. Um, happy Halloween. Yeah. Nice. Oh, I'm wearing my... Uh, see the other side, yeah. My Wallace and Gromit socks. That's about the only thing I really uh, managed to put together. We've been working on this system um, for the past three days or so, and it is rather involved, but it's sort of simplistic in the same, at the same time. And it's interesting to me, all these years later on down the road, I, I, was, um, I was telling Eric over dinner 
last night that the first Moog modular system I ever saw, the first Moog synthesizer I ever saw uh, in person was at a, um, a store in Buffalo, New York. I'm originally from Buffalo, New York. And I was uh, 16 years old and I had a, a keyboard friend, a keyboard player friend of mine, and we had his mother drive us to Transcendental Audio, which I always thought was just the coolest name for a, it was a record shop. Because as Dave Vancouvering would say, nobody wanted to carry synthesizers in a music store. So there was a record store that had, um, you know, uh, turntables at that time and uh, amplifiers and speakers. And stuck in the corner, they had this modular Moog 35 system. The, the guy that worked there couldn't figure out how to make it go. Um, but we just kind of gawked at it and looked at it. And when I th think of a Moog synthesizer, this is what I think of. This is my synthesizer. Um, and then um, flash forward about four years, I went to a two-year technical college up in Buffalo. And right after graduation, I went to work at Moog Music Buffalo. And by that time, uh, the modular synthesizer product line was very small. There was just uh, two guys making them. And most of the energy of Moog Music Buffalo was put into uh, the smaller, um, smaller synthesizers. The Moog Rogue, the Prodigy. Um, I worked on Taurus, uh, Liberation, just to you know, name some names. Memory Moog. Um, <laughs> Mark Vale knows memory mode. Um, so that was sort of uh, my uh, moving through the, the, the process of, of synthesizers. And as good as they sound and as convenient and as easy to play to a certain point as they are, I always miss the, that aspect of modular synthesizers where you could put the input into another input, into and reverse things and turn them upside down and let's see what happens when we do this, which is the magic, I believe, of an analog synthesizer. You grab a knob and something happens. And uh, so to, to me, that, that, was always the, the, uh, that was always a synthesizer. That's what you do with them. And then when this gentleman here, not this gentleman here, but this gentleman on the, uh, the monitor there, um, Keith Emerson, um, started adding on to his system. I just thought it was the most am amazing thing I I'd ever heard. Um, it, it is really the most dangerous synthesizer in the world. As you heard from this system, uh, this can bring down buildings, <laughs> literally. Um, so anyway, uh, this is what the synthesizer looked like in 74. It, it started out as a small 3C system, and he just kept adding on and adding on and adding on and adding on, depending on the, the requirements of the of the the uh, composition and the sounds that he wanted to achieve, and uh, by the time I caught up with the beast, uh, this was uh, 1997 in Atlanta, Georgia. This is the the first uh, show I picked up the tour on, and um, I, it's one of those ones you remember just because it it, it demonstrated the the finickiness and also the power of this instrument, the, the, this, his particular Moog module, they're all awesome, but this one has got, uh, got some character to it. And um, since I'm up here telling war stories, we were, um, Kansas, the, the, the band Kansas was opening for, for uh, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, and so we had all the, the gear uh, downstage a little bit, covered up with reveal cloths, and Kansas had all their stuff set up in front, and so they played their set, and running out, checking the synthesizer, and uh, Actually, hit the, the next button there, I think. Uh, yeah, that's, that's me. What I'm doing in that picture right there is, um, when I came down from Buffalo, I brought uh, a couple of power supplies with me because the power supply for Keith's modular had died. That was one of the, um, the weak links of the modular systems back, uh, back in the day was the power supplies were a little bit flaky. So I brought down the, uh, a power supply and replaced the, uh, uh, this one and so flash forward to uh, 20 minutes before curtain, I go out there to check the tuning on the synthesizer, nothing, it's dead. And you know, the band is standing in the wings waiting to go on, it's like, you know, this kind of thing. And it's like, okay, think. Well, it's like 95 degrees out. This is like 8 o'clock at 8.30 at night. It's eight, 95 degrees out in 95 degree humidity. And so it's like, well, I don't know, I'll just turn off the power supply, turn it off, turn it back on again came right up, right up. Yeah. 
and then went down again. It's like, oh, Christ. So it's like, okay. Well, we still have the reveal cloths on this thing. So it's like, pull the reveal cloths off, uh, off the, the, the instrument, and of course the ah, cheer comes up from the crowd because now you can see the, the, the monster. And check the power supply, and it tuned right up, ran like a top the rest of the night. And as a matter of fact, it was you know, one of those, you know, oh my God, kind of moments. Um, the interesting thing was we, uh, Greg Lake stopped the show after the first tune because the humidity and the heat had crept into the mixing console, so he couldn't hear himself sing. So he, you know, kind of had a, 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 what do you call it, a, a prima, prima donna moment and sort of stopped the show, and we went off, and, you, you know, and then we climbed around inside the monitor, uh, or the monitor mixer, and managed to get it working again so that the band could finish the show. So, one of the other tasks I was charged with was, um, oh, that's, the, uh, that's uh, the schematic that was provided by, uh, by Michelle of the, uh, the, the, some of the hand-drawn schematics that we have for the foundation of, uh, of Keith's system. Are, are, uh, uh, you know, I've got a briefcase and I usually stick my Emerson folder in there, and it's got all these in there. Um, let's do the next one. Oh, so this is the configuration of the, of the system back in 92, and actually this was Mark Vale's uh, article. I, I cropped that out of there. And if you see, uh, putting it all into one box like that, and as it, it grew over time, the organization of it could be changed. And so, and so Eric organizes his module a little bit different than Keith does. And uh, so that's, again, one of the beautiful things about the modular system. You can, you can customize it just by swapping modules out and moving them around. And um, the, the current configuration, if you uh, look in the upper uh, tier on the left-hand side, those are all presets. So to go from sound to sound, there's a, a single button up there. So the uh, Aquatarka sound, you just punch the button. Of course, you really, you know, when this thing's on its, on its car, it's about eight feet in the air. And I always used to joke that I should have a universal harness to like repel back and forth across the front of it when I'm working on it. Um, but just by stabbing one of those buttons, you can change the, the sound of it. And uh, so that was a rather unique feature. The current iteration of the instrument, they're all in the bottom part. That's one of the uh, uh, things you may not have known about the uh, Emerson system is the entire bottom tier is non-functional. They're just face plates. Well, they were in this, this uh, iteration of it. And then uh, later we move some other modules up to the top and put the preset buttons down below. Um, and this is what it looks like in, uh, from the back. And I find it really, uh, it kind of it tickles me because I think that back in the day we used the same adhesive uh, on those little yellow stickers that they uh, use on the space shuttle to keep the, uh, the heat, shield, heat, yeah, heat shield tiles on or something because Eric's got almost all of this, the stickers on, on his modules as well. And a lot of these modules are dated from 67 as well. So um, what else do we have here? Oh, the ribbon controller. This is one of the things you can do with a ribbon controller. Um, <laughs> you can play with your R's. Um, as part of the stage set, we gave Keith a really nice long, uh, I think it was about a 50-foot umbilical cord for his... Uh, uh, for the ribbon controller, and um, this is one way you can play it, uh, aside from just uh, you know running around and touching it with your fingers. Um, one of the other things that Keith charged me to do was that he wanted um, some pyrotechnics on this thing. Now he used to have pyrotechnics back in the day on the ribbon controller, and what it consisted of was a copper tube running along the length of it, and they would tear up little pieces of flash paper and feed them into the little tube, and there was something resembling a flintlock, uh, like a breech loader, on the side, and you would activate this thing and cause a spark and fire flames out of the end of this thing. Well, that uh, it was a good idea until, until he blew off his thumbnail, so it's not, uh, not a good idea. Um, so uh, what I found was a solid state, uh, it's called a GURB, and it's used in, in stage shows. It was uh, more of a recent kind of thing. I found out about it. And it's a, uh, it looks about the size of our Estes rocket engine with some wires coming out. And so you can fire them with a 9-volt battery. And so I uh, aligned four of them on the top of it. 
and uh, designed a little pyrotechnic controller so that you arm it and then fire it, and it fires four of the GURBs in succession in three second intervals, and that's what it looks like. So, and, and, and uh, we did test it for the fire marshal, <laughs> and, but Keith was still, you know, he wasn't quite sure about this new technology, so that's why you see him holding it like way out there, because he didn't want to lose an arm or something like that. And then on the next one you see he got a little bit more comfortable with it. And one of the interesting things is, um, you probably can't see it from, from there, but we cut off the, uh, the little nylon tape that ran on the ribbon controller's uh, contact. Um, and what we found, because whenever I played it or any of the other guys played it when we were, we were testing it, it never sounded the same. It didn't sound as good. And we couldn't figure out what it was and, uh, until we found out that it was sweat. Because Keith sweats a lot when he plays. And so the sweat would actually creep into the trigger bar on it, and it would sound, it, it would sound completely different, which is something I thought really interesting, very amazing. So, um, oh, and then flash forward to uh, 2002, I moved here to work for, uh, for Dr. Robert Moog. Um, that's Steve Dunnington on the left-hand side. That's one of the prototype Voyager keyboards. So that was... Uh, and that was an interesting time as well. So uh, if you want to hear Bob Moog stories, I've got, got uh, everybody's, everybody's got Bob stories, but, uh, um, but that was a, it was a really fun, fun, fun time. And then this May, this was uh, some of the, uh, I built this little montage of some of the photographs when, when Eric and I, or uh, Amos and I were working on uh, Eric's system. And uh, basically, you just pulled everything out of the boxes that uh, Eric had, uh, had uh, thoughtfully labeled everything nice and uh, convenient for us. So put it all together, get it in integrated into the, uh, the road case. One of the things that was necessary was distributing power. Uh, again, on Emerson's system, he had the, uh, it's all in one box, and so the power supplies would, would sit in there on the bottom. But for a situation like this, you need to distribute power and as I've explained, anybody who's ever worked with a modular system, the power supply is crucial, crucial to the functioning of these units. And actually, they, uh, uh, they do impact the tuning. If you have a, a wonky power supply, and, and that's part of the problem of the old Moog synthesizer modular supplies, is they weren't filtered very well. And so they did tend to drift. And now using some of the uh, better technologies to stabilize the uh, power supply. Um, you can get the, the oscillators to tune up and, uh, and stay tuned for, uh, <laughs> for, for at least an hour. Or, uh, but uh, no, actually, we were just commenting, it must be Halloween because all 22 of these guys are just right, are right there, probably for all you people. <laughs> um, so yeah, well, one of the things I wanted to talk about was esoterically, well, I'll take a drink. Oh, there's no water there. I'll trade you. Oops. Um, Cheers. Uh, one of the things that we used to deba uh, debate about with the different synthesizer modules uh, back up in Buffalo, because again, we had several production lines running at once, and so you can listen to the liberation filter as opposed to the prodigy filter, as opposed to the source filter, et cetera, et cetera, and get into these esoteric technical discussions about subtle changes in the, the printed circuit board layouts and why this one sounded a little bit different, this one resonated a little bit different and all that kind of stuff. So the, um, the sonic impact of the Moog filter is, um, you know, uh, one of the, the, the uh, uh, standard discussions about why the thing sounds so good. Um, but one of the other things that occurs to me, especially now that we're all suave and sophisticated in the digital age, is um, the aspect of digital waveform creation versus analog. And this is uh, something for you to consider. Again, why does analog synthesis sound so good? Well, I've got a theory, and it looks something like this. One more, I think. There we go. So if I were, this is a, my, my plucky little sine wave. If I were to record this sine wave, you can see it's got a really nice, smooth, even contour. And, uh, 
And we do note that it's amplitude over time. So the generation of the voltage is uh, very even, moves positive, then moves back negative again, repetitiously, at whatever frequency you're, you're trying to do, and, but it's all voltage versus time. And so now if we take this sine wave and we were to just examine this portion of it, and with a little circle on it, and zoomed in, it would look like something like this. So when you uh, talk about digital sampling, again, we're sampling voltage over time. So the voltage, as it goes up, is essentially taking a snapshot of. So when you play a note on an acoustic guitar, on a classical guitar, on a piano, and generate a really nice continuous waveform, what happens is it is digitized by sample, 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 sample. So there's a voltage amplitude versus time function. And I ask, what happens to the stuff in between? That's called quantization. Uh, there's a also a term called dithering. But there's a rounding error uh, whenever you sample something. And then when you play it back again, it looks something like this. Now, as we've gotten faster processor speeds and um, uh, more sophisticated algorithms for trying to, to uh, mediate that, uh, these discrepancies. They do sound better. The, the, the later generation synthesizers sound better than the, the uh, early FM synthesizers, but I still suggest that it is a non-continuous waveform. And if I put the concept that we are continuous life forms, we live in a continuous environment, um, it's understood that we perceive millions of pieces of information every second of our lives, all of it. We, we are bringing all this information and uh, sounds, smells, sights, um, you know, dimensional, dimensionality, and other energetic aspects that we won't even get into here. The, so we are continuous beings. So why wouldn't a continuous waveform sound better to us? I mean, it, it's a continuous waveform. I would think it would be more organic. And so here we are, you know, when most all of our uh, method of playing back music, re, you know, rec playing back recordings and actually making the recordings is all done in the digital domain. The state of the art, the standard, has sort of become digital. And so when people go back and listen to the old analog synthesizers, um, they can't believe just how more present they sound. You hear words like warm. Um, you know, uh, just in inviting. There's, uh, aside from the control aspect of it, of being able to grab a knob and giving it a twist and having something immediately happen, whereas opposed to, you know, having to go into a, a submenu and a submenu and a submenu in order to change a parameter. Um, I, I just think it's, uh, that's why coming back to analog synthesis is starting to become more and more popular. Um, unfortunately, I was at Moog Music back in, in 85 when we went out of business. And at that time, we were working on the memory Moog uh, um, MIDI interface. And we had uh, Roland, we had, uh, what do we have there? Oh, we had uh, several Yamahas, because we were trying to figure out how to talk to some of these, these keyboards, developing the, the, uh, the MIDI interface for, um, for memory Moog Plus. And uh, because there was no MIDI standard there, you could get two Yamahas to talk to each other, but you couldn't get a Yamaha to talk to the Moog or vice versa. And, um, so here we are listening to these digital synthesizers, the first generation digital synthesizers, and everybody hated them, you know? And we thought, well, you know, and I look back on it now, and I thought at the time, I thought we all hated it because we sort of saw the handwriting on the wall that, you know, Yamaha had 20 engineers working in their keyboard R&D department. We had three. And so it's like, you know, uh, but I, I, now that I look back on it, it we were so accustomed to the analog sound that digital, it just, it just didn't cut it. And um, so I just sort of uh, leave you with that idea. And uh, no matter how fast the sampling rate, it's still a chopped up waveform. And artifacts and other things like that, when it's reconverted into the analog waveform, um, it's not as smooth. It doesn't sound as, as, as real. And I, I draw the analogy of, of uh, of a film. 
you think about what the ens essence of a film is, when you watch a movie, it's still photographs nailed end to end. And they run them and fool your eye, uh, they run them at 30 frames per second and convince your eye that this is continuous motion. But the higher functioning of your brain actually perceives this with that little black bar in there. So you can never look up on the screen and see that, that activity up there and believe that it's real life. I think that's one of the things that mitigates that idea of that being reality. And a non-continuous sound, I believe that we actually can hear that quantization error. It's not something you can say, oh, there it is, but it's there nevertheless. Because again, we do listen with our ears, but we also listen with our body. And our body is a sound receptor. Um, has a, uh, its own uh, innate intelligence to it as well. So uh, that's all I've got. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, August. Excellent. You would never guess that August is a college professor, would you? <laughs> uh, I'd like to introduce uh, our friend Amos Gaines. Amos is, uh, almost anyone that has a Moog synthesizer knows Amos. Uh, he's he's uh, just the guru over there that keeps all of our machines running and just sounding amazing. And I remember when I sent my Voyager back to you after banging it around on the road for a year that when I got it back, I swore that it sounded even better than when it was new. So. Um, Anyway, I'm, I know I'm adding to Amos's workload just by saying things like this. But Amos is going to talk to us uh, a little bit about the modern generation of modular synthesis. And the current Moog Music Company uh, makes products that are indeed modular synthesizer products. Um, we've heard, um, uh, we heard Tara and, and Dorit uh, use some Moger Fogers. Um, with various instruments. Um, the stations over there uh, have uh, the instruments all connected together. Um, and any of those instruments can easily interface with a, an antediluvian uh, piece of equipment like this from 43 years earlier. So over to you, Amos. Thank you very much. Check, check. Hey, okay. So, uh, yeah, as, as uh, Eric was saying, um, Moog. Moog isn't literally still making modular synthesizer modules in the sense that there is a, a new and vibrant generation of modular synthesizer module makers out there right now. If any of you are unaware of this, some of you may well know, you may even have modules by Dopefer and Harvestman and uh, a number of the other uh, Make Noise. Actually, uh, the, the head engineer of Make Noise is here somewhere. Um, Tony Rolando is his name, he's a wonderful individual. Uh, I digress a little bit, but my point is this right now is actually the best time in human history to be into analog modular synthesis. There, there has never been uh, more out there, more new ideas using these uh, fundamental principles of voltage control, freely patchable interconnection, and, and the ability of any process really to interact with and modulate any other process. And, and you know, to the extent that that modular philosophy that was burst by uh, Bob Moog and Herb Deutsch and the other pioneers and led to devices like this, those same ideas are now alive in every medium, you know, including software like Reactor for, uh, you know, for your large uh, computer systems, and there are modular synthesizer digital tools for iPhones. Uh, there's a great one called Jesudo that is, you know, it is literally the same mental process of patching together functions and processes however your mind dictates that they ought to be. If you think, oh, this is really great, but I would like it even more if, uh, you know, this LFO was modulating the amount of time that I was looping a piece of audio over here. All you have to do is think of it, and the tools exist now in the analog and in the digital domains to realize it. And so that method of workflow transcends volt per octave standards, it transcends analog hardware, it's just sort of a mode of manipulating sonic concepts, and you can, you can do that in any medium. And so that's what we are living in today. We, uh, you know, and so leaving the digital aside for the moment and getting uh, back to Moog, um, 
what we what we are making now is individual instruments and effects that all um, most of the important functions and processes not only have knobs to control what they do, uh, you know, which you'll get on a, on a digital instrument, there are digital synths that are covered in hundreds of knobs and they all do really cool stuff when you turn them, but you don't with those digital instruments typically have an output or an input that lets you take that abstract process and feed it into the next thing, you know, across the room, some other interesting gadget that you want to tie into one cohesive whole. Um, and we support that now and in, in what we're doing still. Um, so I guess one of the things that I wanted to talk about uh, relative to this being a ubiquitous concept that uh, it's never been more alive than it is right now is that where I feel like Moog can do some of their best work now and going forward is in exactly the place where these wonderful new abstract digital processes that you have become real and become voltages and interact with the uh, the the analog oscillators and the, as August was saying, these continuous functions that happen in, you know, infinite resolution in, in time and in voltage. You know, you've got functions of voltage over time, you can represent them digitally by some number, uh, you know, and, uh, and some amount of time, but inherently you have a certain resolution below which you can't count anymore. There's a fundamental increment that you're counting in units of digitally, you know, and if you have a, you know, a, a million bit long number, uh, it's still at the very end, you have to increment it by some fixed quantum that you can identify. It's yay big, however big that is. And the beauty of analog, you know, an analog oscillator, an analog filter, is that uh, down to some sort of maybe conceptual hyperspace limit, uh, you know, but down to the granular level at which reality can be perceived, it is infinite and you can keep subdividing and subdividing and whatever your arbitrary process is, um, it's, it is as, as completely continuous as, as we can define. And so that's what you have with an analog oscillator, such as we still make, but now you have this wonderful ability to take that analog oscillator and these analog filters, and digital control has become good enough that you can come up with an arbitrary process like you might do in Reactor or like you might do in some fantastic computer program and output that as a voltage that's directly linked to the analog oscillator. And that gives you, you know, and filter and envelopes and so on. And that gives you the ability to make instruments such as we're making now. Uh, the little fatty, the Taurus, the Taurus 3, which is a new mode product from last year. Uh, I was very involved in writing the firmware for that. And so, so that's the perspective that I'm coming from, is that the, the other Moog engineers are much more talented in the analog domain and they've created these beautiful oscillators and beautiful sounding filters. And then they give me these tools and they give me this arbitrary processor, this embedded processor that runs code. And what that means is that I can use that processor to think of some behavior that I want to have happen. The user presses a button, what happens? It's completely arbitrary. It's, you can just magically define it in code and create a process like, let's say, an arpeggiator that plays a series of notes in time with, um, you know, in time with some clock, in time with your laptop, perhaps. You're playing Ableton Live, you hook it up via USB to this, this magical device here that has an arbitrary processor and continuous analog, warm sounding tone generators. And just by, just by writing some code and just by defining any process that you can think of that's supported, you can then get that beautiful pure tone in being controlled in ways that were, that were never possible in the 100% analog domain. And in the 100% analog domain, if you want to make a sequencer, you have to have, let's say, 64 knobs and a bank of analog switches and all of this plumbing and hardware and all of this stuff costs money and how, you know, if you've ever actually tried to build a sequencer and thought, well, one knob's not that expensive and then you look at 64 of them and you're, you know, you're out a couple hundred bucks and all you've got is a pile of knobs, you don't even start to have a sequencer. You know, and these are the limitations that were uh, in place from the invention of these ideas up until very recently. And now, if a knob is six lines of code that exists somewhere, then they're basically free. You can have as many knobs as you have memory in which to hold the code that defines what a knob does. And the beauty of being able to hook that into a continuous real analog process is that you don't sacrifice anything in sound quality. You've created a tone that resonates with people in an organic, natural way. It's beautiful sounding. So you're not sacrificing the stuff that we love about this wonderful world of sound generation, but you're taking all of the best strengths of the digital domain 
and you're marrying them to all of the best strengths of the analog domain and not really losing anything, in, in my view. And so that's what excites me. That's, that's my perspective, where I'm coming from as sort of one of the people that's helping to shape where we go from here. And you know, I listen to, to what uh, artists are doing with our equipment. I look at what artists are doing in the purely digital domain, and I think, how cool would that be if instead of some DSP oscillators doing this incredible fractal dance that's inspired by uh, you know, a video camera pointed at falling snow. There's, I mean, it's, if you can think of it, you can do it now. But um, I feel like my role is to preserve the, the continuity and the sonic experience that is you know, it's so vital and fundamentally good that Bob and, and all of uh, you know, our friends and forebears have, have, uh, have given to us and look at all of the wonderful, incredibly uh, open and, and infinitely um, reconfigurable ideas that you now have in the digital domain. How do we take all of that good stuff and allow it to happen with this wonderful analog technology that there's, there's no reason to get rid of? It's like a classical, it's like a classical instrument, uh, you know, the, the voltage-controlled oscillator and voltage-controlled filters, and they're, you know, they're a part of our sonic vocabulary now. And how do we keep that going into the future? I think we do that by embracing all of the wonderful and arbitrary ways that we can control those sounds in new ways and um, building new instruments that, that give, us, give us the best of both of those things. And so that's, uh, that's my goal at this point, and that's what I'm trying to do. And in the last several years, I started with Moog in 2004, I believe. Uh, Bob was still still with us. I was very privileged to to work with him directly for uh, a year or two before he uh, passed away, as we know. And um, in that time, um, I've been listening to you know a lot of the people in this room called me at uh, various times over the years with ideas, with questions, with complaints, even. And uh, you know, and taking all of that in stride is is how to learn what's happening now and what needs to happen next. And uh, so I hope uh, this little uh, rambling train of thought has given you some, some idea of what I'd like to have happen next. I'm very excited. As I said, this is the best time in history to be into modular synthesis. And, and the definition of what modular synthesis is and can be is growing and redefining itself every day now in a way that it's just it's a delight for me to see. And uh, so I encourage all of you, if, if, you're really, if you're already familiar with what I'm talking about, that's wonderful and we get to share in this, in this great thing and, and I'm very glad and, and, and I hope you share that. Uh, and if, if this is new and you're not quite sure what I'm talking about, but it's more interesting than not, uh, as I hope it was, um, then I encourage you to look out there, you know, look, you know, Google analog module, analog modular synthesis and see the dozens of of manufacturers that are out there now. There were maybe three or four back in the day. Beep! And uh, quite all right. Just uh, providing a little sonic example, modular synthesis. Boop. Anyway, um, so look out there and see what's going on nowadays because it's truly incredible. And, and even just to see what people have thought of, you know, new sequencers, new kinds of complex oscillators, three-dimensional wavetable scanning modules. You know, I, can, I, I could just uh, you know, keep talking until I stop making any sense to anyone but the, the, uh, the extremely uh, modular obsessed. But the stuff that's out there is amazing. Look for it and, and, and you know, imagine what it can do. And then maybe, if you can, get a chance to listen and see for yourself, because there's nothing more inspiring than direct personal experience. And uh, so I hope in some way I've been able to reflect some of that direct personal experience that I've had and communicate some of that inspiration and enthusiasm. I think that's what I have to say. Thank you. <laughs> Amos Gaines, Jack Skellington. Um, we're going to wrap it up here in just a, a moment, but I think uh, the best way with this beautiful instrument standing up here is, is just uh, to give you guys a little bit of a cacophony to, to end this on. So um, we're going to show you a little, just a little bit of, of modular synthesis here. So. Um, we talked about you know, the stereo uh, monophonic voices that I have set up. Over here in this rack, uh, I have uh, a voice that's being uh, played from the Voyager. The Voyager is just acting as a controller. Uh, it's going um, MIDI out into a MIDI to control voltage converter uh, into this rack here. So, and then I've got the little LEDs kind of signaling you like what's, what's doing what. So. 
And I see our echo is good and loud. All right. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take the control voltage uh, away from the Voyager. Uh, now we're going to patch in uh, the output from our sequencer that was doing our sample and hold, but now we're going to switch it to its internal clock. Okay, it's doing something. Uh, we are going through, we have uh, this mix of oscillators, instead of going through this, this low pass filter that we have over here, uh, we've now repatched it into the high pass filter. Uh, and then the uh, output of the high pass is going over to this fixed filter bank. Will this reach? Apparently it will. Okay, there we go. That sounds like something. So August, why don't you go... Uh, just turn some knobs and make some noise over there. So each, um, each stage on our sequencer is a set voltage. And as it steps through each stage, it's sending a different control voltage to the oscillators, which is this kind of wild jumping sound you're hearing right now. And then that's going through a fixed filter bank, which is essentially a um, subtractive EQ. So when all the knobs are turned all the way to the right, you're flat. And then as August turns them to the left, uh, he's actually cutting those frequencies. And it's a really specific, a very just classic um, Moog sound and modular synthesis sound. And then, of course, when we have our sequence here, we can speed it up. Do all that kind of stuff. We have a, a, a slew limiter on here, which we also call glide or portamento, which makes the transitions between the steps a little more smooth. There we go. There we go, some, some uh, live improvisation on the modular synth. So okay, the power of modular synthesis, Amos Gaines, Eric Norlander, August Worley. Thanks for coming, thanks to everybody. Uh, we'll go out there and uh, if anyone wants to come say hello, um, of course have a look at the instrument. Uh, I have some CDs for sale over there if you wanna help feed the uh, modular synth and all that. Thanks again guys, see you later.